Welcome pre-Cairo students, Cairo students, and anybody else interested in hearing these conversations that aim to contextualize the path of what it looks like to become a chiropractor and also to illustrate uh, any fine details that we can that helps people better make, uh, make better decisions, make more informed decisions, and be just clearer mm -hmm. in general. And uh, today we have Dr. Eric Russell, um, somebody I've been following for a while. Dr. Eric, can you kind of just get us started by introducing yourself and uh, sharing a little bit about what attracted you to this profession, where you were at in life, and, and why did you decide to become a chiropractor? Oh, awesome. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Russell. I'm the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at Life University. Um, I'm a 1996 graduate from Palmer College of Chiropractic in Davenport, Iowa, and actually just grew up on a farm uh, about an hour south of Davenport in Illinois. So my journey to chiropractic was kind of, uh, I'm a first generation chiropractor. I didn't know that chiropractic would choose me as a career and I'm grateful that it did. Um, what happened was I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my career, my life at that moment in time in college. And I turned and looked at my daughter in the back seat of the car and was subluxated, but you know, got that stiff neck, couldn't turn it. And a friend of mine who was getting ready to go to chiropractic school said, why don't you try a chiropractor? So I did. And I was literally in chiropractic school about eight months later and just yeah. so grateful it happened. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that time of life, like deciding you wanted to go to chiropractic school and then what you did to prepare yourself, what that process looked like? I know it was a while ago, but uh, oh, yeah. it happened <laughs> quick. eight months is not a lot of time. So what, what were you trying to do to get ready or kind of, yeah, what did that look like? Yeah, I thank you. I, I didn't have a lot of experience in chiropractic at that point in my life. Um, not to me, I, I think my granddad went to a chiropractor maybe, but no one else in my family really did or my friends. So I just didn't know about it. Um, at the time I was in college, I wanted to do something health related. Um, I thought about dentistry. And then I went up to a dental school interview in Chicago. They had like an open house day and they started showing slides of gum surgery, you know, which is probably a weeding out process. And I was just like, this is not, it's not for me. You know, I was like, nope. And then um, I went to start looking into podiatry because I was into sports like a lot of people. And I thought, well, that'd be cool to be a sports uh, podiatrist, but I, I just wasn't feeling the feet either, you know? So I was kind of at the point in my life where uh, what was my interested in? It's like, well, obviously I didn't like surgeries and injuries that much. Um, they kind of curl my stomach a little bit when I see something that's really gnarly. Some people get excited. I was like, Ugh. but I kind of like health. And so I was thinking about, well, what's those options for me? what can I do to have a, a better career of health? I wasn't really interested in like personal training or corporate fitness, something like that. I wanted to do something more with the health profession. And that's when the door opened for chiropractic. So I just kind of tell students, it doesn't matter how you get to chiropractic school. I mean, I've taught fourth generation chiropractic students and I've taught first. We each have our own kind of background to bring to the situation. If you're a fourth generation chiropractor, you got the family legacy. So if you want to live up to that legacy, that's a little bit of pressure. And sometimes I get students who are from legacy chiropractic families and they don't want to do the same thing as their family. So it's a different journey for as a first generation, you got the whole thing open to you. So I just went to chiropractic school open, um, thought why not? It just kind of naturally fit me. It, the doors opened the more I leaned into it. So I just kept leaning it was mm -hmm. the best way to put it. That's my mm -hmm. journey into chiropractic school. Mm -hmm. And then can you talk about the difference between being uh, going into chiropractic school and going into chiropractic? So what was your journey into chiropractic? Did it happen right when you got to chiropractic school or did it happen a little bit later on down the road? <sighs> you mean journey into falling in love with chiropractic or practicing yeah. chiropractic? Yeah, uh, falling in love with chiropractic and just... Um, were you immediately exposed to the science, philosophy, and art as soon as you arrived to chiropractic school? Before you got to chiropractic school, did it happen later on? That was more the question. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Thanks for that. When I was in chiropractic school, I that friend of mine that referred me to chiropractic school was like maybe a year ahead of me at Palmer. So some of my introductions were to that. 
um, some of the things I picked up were basically I'd, I'd hear things from him, some of the clubs he was doing, it kind of led me down some of that technique path, but I just started to date around with clubs when I was in chiropractic school and just, there's just so many. And I went to a, a school at Palmer during a time that was very kind of exciting. There's a lot of experts in the field that were colleagues of mine in chiropractic school. So you were learning with them. So, I mean, I remember going to almost every technique club I could think of. That's the initial thing. So I tell my, the students I've taught, you should date around while you're in chiropractic school, find what really fits you. So for technique, I remember starting out with like palpation because you just want to get your hands on everything. There was a plethora of upper cervical techniques that were available at Palmer during that time. Some of the techniques that um, were pretty commonplace for me back in the 90s that you don't hear too much about, like Pettibon, Pierce, Stillwagon, those were some of those techniques. I know people still practice those and they're still um, flourishing in areas. I would just start to go through all of those. So what fit me was I ended, I landed on Gonstead. Um, I preferred the specificity. I preferred having a good analysis. And then I liked getting adjusted Gonstead. So for students out there, sometimes they're like, what technique do I do? I'm like, what, how do you like to be adjusted? That's kind of like the easiest place to go fishing, so to speak. And mm -hmm. I really got heavy into Gonstead when I was in chiropractic school. So that's where the art was. I probably had 26 Mount Horb seminars. I interned at uh, a GMI doctor, Dr. Herb Wood, who's very popular in teaching Gonstead out in the field today. I interned in his office for three years. Every Monday night, you know, went and worked in his office, so learned a lot from that experience. And, and Dr. Wood eventually was a reader in my wedding, you know, considered him one of those mentors in technique. And that technique journey is interesting because I liked learning from people who were like five, six and about 160 pounds, but I am not five, six and 160 pounds. So quick, I'm just not that quick as some of those people that I watched learned Gonstead. So finding the person like Dr. Wood that kind of had similar body type and similar adjusting really helped me get an aha moment. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the journey with technique for philosophy, which is kind of what I specialize in. I wasn't a philosophy head in chiropractic school. You know, it was around all the time. And what happened is my journey into philosophy was when I graduated, I got a job working in an office. And quite frankly, it just kind of turned into a job. Um, I, I initially thought, well, maybe this guy should be a better mentor. And now in retrospect, I probably didn't tell him what my needs were, you know, <laughs> that I wanted to be mentored. So I, I got to this experience where I was working in the office. It was great because it allowed my wife who was working on a PhD. We had our son. It allowed that experience and it was a great place to work for five years. But I kind of got frustrated and I thought, well, man, it's only year one into practice. Why am I frustrated and kind of burnt out when you see so many other people that love and are inspired by chiropractic? And my simple answer was when I started looking at this, those people knew chiropractic, they knew chiropractic philosophy, and that started that journey. So I would contact Dr. Rob Sinnott and was like, hey, I want to learn more about philosophy. And there's an interesting story of how I met him and just said, hey, how do I learn more? And they're like, well, here's the Stevenson's textbook. So that led to the LCP at Palmer, working with Dr. Fred Barge, doing the diplomat, and then later start teaching and being recognized as a chiropractic philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, person in the field, which is just, just while we're just right. while we're on this topic, can yeah. you kind of uh, share with students that are just hearing some of these things for the first time, the LCP, Dr. Rob Sinna, can you talk about what resources he's contributed to the field, what the LCP program is, who Fred yeah. Bard was? Sure. Uh, so that we can help people uh, take that next step towards exploring these these different directions? Yeah, it, you know, for the chiropractic students and pre-chiropractic students, there's a lot of areas that you can specialize in chiropractic. Um, I always tell my students that our strength is our diversity. It doesn't help lay people that you can go to so many different chiropractors and they practice so many different ways, but I actually think that's a strength. I always kind of joke, it's like, I wouldn't want to have the same beer every day so craft beer movement, like some are IPAs, some are stouts. That's 
that's kind of the analogy I like for chiropractic is you can do someone that's more into wellness, pediatrics, sports. You can do someone that's more into upper cervical technique. They can be, you know, soft technique. They could be whatever it is. You can find that person that matches you. So as long as you do that exploration as a patient, you'll find a chiropractor that's right for you. So as on the chiropractic side, um, you can have, there's so many postgraduate works that you can do. You know, oftentimes you'll see a certificate program that's a hundred hours in a year after graduation. And then there's also diplomat programs in chiropractic and some are within schools and some are by chiropractic organizations. So in chiropractic philosophy, the kind of the history of that is probably around two, 1999 when Dr. Weekman was president of Palmer, Dr. Fred Barge was working there. And if you don't know who Dr. Fred Barge is, you should pick up his book, Life Without Fear. Um, he was an icon in chiropractic and kind of the like the most interesting man in chiropractic. He was he was a legend on how he spoke. He was a he could hold court anytime he went somewhere. Um, he was just a chiropractor's chiropractor is how I describe Dr. Barge. So they set up this program while they were at Palmer called the Legion of Chiropractic Philosophers. So it was a 100 hour, one year program. And that's where a lot of my friends and colleagues went through that program. Uh, Dr. Rob Sinnott, who's an expert in chiropractic philosophy in the profession, Dr. Brad Polk, who is a genius, Dr. Dan Lyons. I mean, there was numerous of us, probably, I think we graduated 33 people incidentally in that program at the end. Um, and then we fell in love with chiropractic philosophy because it wasn't the, it wasn't the motivational talk for chiropractic. It wasn't the spiz and, and make yourself feel good. It was really getting into the meat of chiropractic philosophy. So you're diving deep into these concepts. And I love that. Like I love getting into the, the steak and not the sizzle of chiropractic and really exploring those concepts deeply. And that was the first session we went to was on the normal complete cycle and it blew us all away because we thought who's going to come in here and be a cheerleader and these two presenters just went deep with the normal complete cycle deeper than i had experienced previously and i was like whatever that is i want more of that so after we went through that program i think palmer held the lcp for roughly uh maybe three or four years um we started the diplomat program through the ica so there's a diplomat in chiropractic philosophy. So there was two additional years that we tacked on through the ICAs to get diplomat status in chiropractic philosophy. Later, um, Sherman started a year one program and there's another year one program that a different organization, the Center for Chiropractic Progress has, but it's basically committing yourself to a diplomat level of understanding of chiropractic philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that might be really surprising to listeners to hear that there's enough to explore, enough depth to it that you can spend years uh, just to get a certificate that acknowledges that you've explored the philosophy enough to be considered a, a diplomat. What, a, what do you think a diplomat means in today's world? Uh, how is that helpful as far as an acknowledgement or, um, you know, I'm just curious your thoughts on today's program, like what people come away with and some of the outcomes that you see graduates of these programs uh, using the program to to maybe further their professional pathway in any way. Yeah, you know, my favorite quote in Stevenson's, one of them is he's like, chiropractic philosophy is just a sliver of what philosophy is, but it's enough to devote yourself to for a lifetime. And the why of chiropractic is what we're discussing when we talk about chiropractic philosophy. And it's so interesting uh, teaching that topic that for me, philosophy is kind of like, this is my why. This is what gave me certainty as a chiropractor. And since it is a topic that is, has, a, I guess, immaterial or metaphysical components to it that aren't easily measured by science, Chiropractic philosophy has turned into kind of a controversial topic to some people within chiropractic. Should we include it or should we not? So you have some institutions that are like chiropractic cent philosophy is central to what chiropractic is. It's one of the three legs, philosophy, science, and art. 
just because you love chiropractic philosophy doesn't mean you should be anti-science. I think that's a, a bad, just a bad critical thinking there. Um, but I know when philosophy is important and I know when science is important. I have a good relationship and they're, they're kind of feed each other. They're not mutually exclusive. So I love working at an institution like Life University. It's like this is, you know, we're our vitalistic school. We're going to plant that flag and say this philosophy is important to us. But the topic itself is kind of interesting. So you get some people who are really heavy into science and they've never thought about theoretical models. They never thought about philosophy. And they kind of have this journey where they have to try to, well, how do I know this concept exists even though I can't be measured by science? And I always equate that to, I stole this from my wife, but the beauty of a rose. Like if you want to measure length of a rose, you use a ruler. If you want to measure weight of a rose, you use a scale. Those gives you numbers. But most people buy roses because they're symbolic or they're beautiful which are kind of concepts that aren't measured very easy. You can't put a ruler to beauty or a ruler to love. And that's how I kind of view chiropractic philosophy. It is that certainty of why chiropractic, what chiropractic is, the why of chiropractic. And it, it doesn't fit some traditional science models, but it's not designed to. Mm -hmm. So I love going into philosophy. So the, the people to answer your question, you know, when I went to chiropractic school, I kind of feel this legacy passing. I'm in my mid fifties now. I graduated 25 years ago. It feels like I was in chiropractic school yesterday, you know, for a lot of reasons. And all those icons that were around chiropractic when I was in chiropractic school, Dr. Maxine McMullen, who was one of the founders of the pediatric movement, uh, like Perler, Webster, Joan Fallon, Peter Fish, kind of started the whole pediatric chiropractic movement. Um, you get Dr. Fred Barge, uh, Dr. Bud Crowder, who ran the BJ Palmer Clinic. Um, just all these people were around when I was in chiropractic school. And all of a sudden you look around, Dr. Barge had this saying that's like, you young lions have to step up because us old dinosaurs won't be there forever. And all of a sudden, those that legacy of the people before me, I mentioned Dr. Mary Ann Pruitt. I have to because she was an icon for me as well, are no longer here. So the people who are teaching chiropractic philosophy now were people like myself, um, like I said, Rob Sinnott, I'm Brian Flannery. I'm just trying to think of all the names. We were people that learned from those people, but and we started teaching it. And then all of a sudden, you're the expert. And you kind of like, how the heck did that happen? But this because you kept involved with it. You kept growing. You kept looking deeper. I love topics about chiropractic philosophy that make me think. I love not not having that. I love getting asked a question I don't have an answer for. That makes me go dig an answer and come back. And all of a sudden, you become the expert. Like things just flow out of your mouth, and you're like, "How did that happen?" But that knowledge base that you've been building the whole time gets kind of assimilated and packaged and comes out. Absolutely, yeah. No, obviously, you having a partnership uh, with your wife who was a PhD in sociology, I believe, yeah. and the mm -hmm. cross section of sociology and chiropractic is something that's really near and dear to me because I think that I think that this population of pre-chiropractic students from a sociological point of view has never been studied or or focused on before right. and um, in that is just so much magic that I can't really even put words to it. what's possible if we really help this population blossom and see what they're capable of because obviously they have more time uh, than a, a typical chiropractic student and they're also not indoctrinated by the school's sort of opinions on the profession that get laid down early on, either by upperclassmen or teachers. Um, one of the things that I think is paramount is that uh, philosophy teachers collaborate with one another between schools to set a precedent that schools are collaborative by nature. I don't think that um, the sociological context just bring, just bring that to a head. Um, that our student bodies are leveraging each other enough as being like peers right. and, and that mutual respect and shared experiences. I think that could be facilitated. I know that you don't have a lot of time as a teacher and also a, a, a VP of all the stuff that you do, but I, I do think that these are good initiatives to sort of drip into these different cultures and say, hey, you know, if you're really into Gonstead, why don't you reach out to the Gonstead Club at this other school and maybe you guys can learn from each other because you're so passionate about the same things, right? But anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent. Well, I, am, I am curious. 
Go ahead. Let's see there. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like I'm jumping here and it's like, that's a cool topic. Um, you know, my wife is a PhD in sociology. She got her PhD from the University of Missouri. Um, she started, she studied chiropractic for her dissertation. And basically I talk about this. I started eight months later at chiropractic school. It was roughly six months before I started chiropractic school when my wife and I started dating. So, I mean, I went up, she went to Missouri. I was up in, Il in Iowa. We spent chiropractic school long distance and she started studying chiropractic because she's like, well, that's kind of what my boyfriend's fiance does. And her dissertation was on the difference between professionalism and entrepreneurialism throughout the history of chiropractic. So my wife became an expert in chiropractic basically by watching and being involved and seeing what I do. And one of the things that happened is we, we kind of have this, as Dr. Brian McCauley put in his article, we kind of get a polemic within chiropractic. We get, you know, we kind of have a couple different viewpoints of the profession that exist simultaneously within the, within chiropractic. And it creates this for, and I'll make it extreme. We have one side, like at Life University, it's like subluxation and adjustments kind of central to what chiropractic is. It's kind of not negotiable. You know, the adjustment is not the only thing you can do, but it's probably the most important thing you can do. And I'm paraphrasing if I, in case I get, you know, step out of line. And then the second one is there's a group of chiropractors that say there's really philosophy should not be ta taught in chiropractic school. Vitalism should not be taught in chiropractic school. The subluxation is really a sticky joint. There's no interference to innate intelligence, those concepts. And I always joke with students that it's kind of like your water skis are doing this within the profession of chiropractic. So there's so much diversity within chiropractic and there's so many, um, I apologize, my espresso machines making some noise back there. Um, there's so much diversity within chiropractic and so much kind of within the spectrum there. It's really a, a pretty immense continuum that exists that students, when they start chiropractic school, a lot of them just go from high school to college to chiropractic school and they're trying to figure out their life you know, who they are, what they believe in as a person, they're, they're maybe find their significant other. They're, they're trying to figure out them. Then they have to figure out a profession that has some diversity to it and these kind of poles that exist within it. And it creates this dynamic where they have to figure out where they fit within that pole. And I tell students, the only way you can figure out is you have to engage, like g get your networks and engage and then how do you know you go too far? Well, all of a sudden you're like, this doesn't really fit me. And then you can kind of go back the other way. So students at least engage with the profession, find their spot, find their tribe, find their niche. But people who don't engage and just kind of sit back and just want to get through school, they struggle because when they graduate, they kind of really don't know who they are. They don't know who they are as a chiropractor. They don't have a chiropractic why. And now they're trying to figure it out. And it's kind of, you know, you want to take advantage of that when you're in chiropractic school. So that, sorry, that was pretty long and winding, but that's all the thoughts kind of, that's such a great question that you asked me. I was like, oh, there's a lot to talk about there. I, I just feel like given your partnership with your wife and the fact that you two kind of powwow, given that you've been in multiple leadership positions in chiropractic education, that it's only fitting to have a conversation with you about kind of the stewardship of the profession from an education standpoint, not the, so there's the profession, there's the education, and then there's the practice. And then you could just say there's the chiropractor. Um, and basically, I think that you've been playing for at least two decades now in this sort of education profession level where you've nice. made contributions to New Zealand Chiropractic College to allow for more portability or interportability between different countries, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a huge contribution. And I'd love to hear sort of that process of like, what I'm, what I'm noticing is, you know, after having been in the profession for about 12, 13 years, and I started at one of these schools you're talking about that, that thinks one way, and then I transferred to another school yep. that thinks the complete opposite way. So, and I wasn't from a chiropractic family. So I just kind of, yeah, I just kind of uh, look at this and I say to myself, okay, we have all these brilliant chiropractors that have made all these significant contributions that 
most people don't even really know about a lot of the chiropractors that have made these contributions, whether it's Joe Strauss's books and like he wrote a book on Reggie Gold that is right. an amazing book, or you've got Rob Sinod's book on chiropractic philosophy, or anyway, on and on and on. I could go with all the Fred Bards, Are You a Doctor, Doctor? And so yeah. I just found these in my in my second school's library and just went through them and was blown away that we don't get exposed to these at all at some schools, barely at all at most schools. Um, you have to go find it yourself. So. Um, a lot of what this project's about is just exposing people to what's already been created so that people could feel that support of, of exploring the philosophy, um, even if, you know, it's not being taught. But anyway, I'm getting off tangent. My point is, though, is that you as a person in education, kind of politics, even though I'm sure you kind of stay out of that as much no, as you can. Been in <laughs> you're in both. It's like a lot of students are not practicing after a couple of years and they leave the profession completely. So it's like, how have you been able to identify um, ways? Cause I know that you do curriculum program design. How have you been able to identify ways that we can cat, we can capture the attention of students that are just maybe a little dis disenchanted with the, the decision they made. They don't see themselves want to put hands on people or touch people or take care of people. They don't want to necessarily practice chiropractic but maybe they'd be a great PhD candidate or maybe they should go into research or maybe they should go into education and do some of the types of stuff that you've been doing. Like, do you see an avenue that we could create so that we could create more Dr. Eric Russells who were chiropractors that, st that sort of stepped into education and started to build um, impacts through, through, yeah. different, through different initiatives or different actions? Well, I can tell that any student listening is I had zero idea that I would have the career path that I have. And if, and I'm sure there was classmates of mine at Palmer, if you said he's going to be a future chiropractic college president, be like that dude, you know, it's just the most important thing is you have to find yourself. And what I do with students is take them through an exercise where they identify their core values. You know, mine's, mine's gratitude. Um, integrity is my highest core value. Stewardship, as you've talked about, is one of my core values. And once you become more aware of your driving core values, you want to start aligning yourself with those. So, for example, for me, my journey into chiropractic education, I never thought in a million years I would take this journey. But I think about the profession kind of more than I thought about my practice building. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love practice. I practiced for 15 years, started my own practice, had it for 10 years. But when I got an opportunity to teach, it's less pay. It's thankless. But I was like, man, I can have a bigger impact. So one of my one of my dear mentors, my Mount Rushmore of chiropractic, one of them is my wife, for sure. You know, I have Dr. Barks, Dr. Sinnott, Dr. Sheila Marsh is on that. It's for my personal life. And I remember asking my wife, I'm like, I'm thinking about teaching. And she's like, duh. And I was like, okay, that's a little harsh. But I went to Dr. LaMarche and said, I'm thinking about kind of starting to go into teaching. And he's like, duh. So these guys could see things, my passion that I couldn't see because all my identity was wrapped up into practice. How many people I'm seeing a week, what technique I am, how much money I'm making, all that was just tech is practice based. But my true passion is chiropractic students and, and making a difference in the profession, making that profession a better place um, for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And once I kind of got in line with that, then opportunities started. You know, I started teaching at Parker um, and I was commuting 75 miles from my house to teach, come back at night and practicing. I got the opportunity to go to New Zealand and actually, it's my wife that got asked to speak at New Zealand. That's how they knew me. And so when I applied for the presidency, I got it offered. And I remember turning to my wife. I'm like, holy crap. She's like, it's your dream job. Take it and we'll figure it out. And it was just that simple. You know, so it's like as long as I feel like I'm making a difference, I lean into it. And then once it's no longer beneficial, then I get out of it. So I've been involved in, I was on the board of directors for the ICA, younger in my career, I was the Illinois rep, um, probably around that 1999 time that I talked about being the LCP. 
So I got involved in politics. I've always been involved in politics in my state associations, the Illinois Prairie State Chiropractic Association, uh, the Chiropractic Society of Texas. So there's, you got to leave it better than you found it. And so I remember Dr. Chris Kent saying, just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean it doesn't take an interest in you. So what's important for students to understand is find your passion. Like I know several chiropractic students that I've mentored that they're like, I love academia. I'm like, well, then go into academia, get your PhD or be it. You know, I've got some that became DAC bars or they start teaching at chiropractic schools. There's there's a need for that. We want teachers who are fired up and passionate about chiropractic to teach future chiropractors. So if that's your journey, we should support them. So I never, ever want to hear someone say, well, those who can't teach, you know, why don't you support those that want to make a difference by teaching? And the same thing goes to the research. Like I'm just not cut out to be a full-time researcher. I've done some studies. I've published some papers. I give money for research, but I know some people who love to do research. So I try to support them, you know, and the same thing with practice. So I think we need to be more tolerant of each other's role within the profession of chiropractic and start supporting each other in those roles. And that's how we basically, you know, will rise the tide is every one of us doing our job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can you kind of just reflect on your experience witnessing the new generation coming in and and some of the the reasons they're coming in how how early in the program do you get uh the students at life you first quarter okay so you're you're right there with them week yep. one um do you do you i'm just gonna ask you this straight up do you think that it would be helpful for them to have already studied chiropractic philosophy before they enter your class on week one um helpful yes but not a requirement i didn't yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was just. In what way would it be helpful? Well, again, I think you have to. I think chiropractic students have to figure out themselves and how they fit within the profession. Um, so the more, the, the sooner they start that journey, the better. So if you get like a second, third, fourth, maybe even fifth generation chiropractic student, they kind of know what chiropractic is. They've been around it. They heard it at the dinner table. They're just trying to figure out their path. But for first, we have two types of first generation students to start any chiropractic school. You know, one of them is they had an experience and, and they're there. So they got a little bit of background about what chiropractic is. There are some students that enter chiropractic school because they hear it's a great profession and they just don't have a rich background of chiropractic. I was one of those students 25, you know, 30 years ago. And it doesn't doesn't prohibit them from being a successful student. They just have a different starting point. Mm -hmm. So they have to kind of, if you have zero experience in chiropractic and you get exposed to chiropractic philosophy, it's often a shock because you have the existing paradigm that they've been brought up with. I'm thinking about Dr. Jim Parker said, mother, father, preacher, teacher. You know, if you've always been told throughout life, hey, you heard, go to get a, an aspirin, you know, you kind of have this outside in thinking and all of a sudden you're sitting in quarter one philosophy class and the, and the nutty professors up front talking about ADIO, you know, health comes from within. You're not lacking anything. Let's just remove the interference. It's, it's a challenge to their existing paradigm. And I think they need to be challenged on that paradigm, but it's tough because they just never thought about it before. So they're sitting in class going, what the heck am I getting myself into? This doesn't fit the model of health. They never thought about what health is, to be honest. And now you're starting to challenge all those existing thoughts in their paradigm. And they have to kind of go through this process where you it gets dismantled and gets rebuilt up again. That's a that's a tough process where you're trying to memorize the Krebs cycle. You know, you've got 20 some hours of basic sciences, all the bumps on the bones, all the muscles, origin and assertions. And then you're trying to you're getting challenged on your existing health paradigm. So those people just need a little time and space to kind of figure things out. And usually their surrounding in school and who they're exposed to will either assist or sometimes hinder that journey. But they need to start. I always tell them I use the example of peanut butter and chicken noodle soup. I like chicken noodle soup and I like peanut butter, but they don't go together. So, you know, you got to start looking for those contradictions as Dr. Jim Temple and Dr. Cameron say, and start eliminating them. And 
not everyone wants to engage in that process, but I try to encourage them and nudge them like, hey, you need to be around people. Or I try to connect them with, with students who are switched on, help them build their networks outside, give them kind of say, you know, you need to work on this, but let me give you a little space to work on it. It's kind of something else I like to encourage students. I hear you. I just have my own experience that I'm basing this on. And I know yeah. that depending on which school you go to, your belief system might not be challenged. Uh, the chiropractic philosophy teacher or whatever they're calling it at that school might actually be trying to match your paradigm and be familiar to you and, and actually align with whatever that current paradigm is when they're, when they're speaking about who you're becoming as a chiropractor. Um, meaning... Yeah. A lot of people are not being challenged to, to uh, get clear on what their paradigm is for health and well-being. So I just put that back to you that um, if pre Cairo existed and it was well structured and it had great outcomes that every student, regardless of what school they went to, would at least have maybe not the most solid foundation like you want a student to have when they leave your your. Uh, philosophy one class, but they're going to have a familiarity so that if they enter school and they're not hearing this message at all, right. that it causes them to look elsewhere. Like, where can I go to at least have a, yeah. a chiropractic education since that's what I signed up for? You know, I, I think the institution is responsible for creating the environment. And I talked about the continuum that exists in chiropractic. My personal opinion, and I, the reason I base this on is I've been really affiliated with vitalistic or middle of the road chiropractic schools. Let's just take the extreme. I, you know, when I was in New Zealand, it, it, it really holds itself to be a vitalistic school and puts it out there. There's mechanistic students that graduate from New Zealand. And there's some fantastic philosophical vitalistic students that graduate from the most mechanistic schools you can think of. Those students that have to swim against the stream kind of are usually pretty sharp because they had to spend the majority of their time going against the grain. And they're pretty, pretty sharpened by that time they graduate. They're oftentimes disgruntled because they're like always like their their inherent values don't match the institution they're at. So they're always at a tug of war. But the reality is they're pretty they're pretty ninja like when they graduate because they really had to figure out who they are because they're going against the grain. If you're in a school that kind of aligns with you, you can have the opposite where you can just kind of go down the river's flowing and you're floating down the river with it, but you're not actively trying to swim anywhere. So you're just kind of getting caught up in the stream that helps build a background for students, like a, a context that they're surrounded, like here at life university, students are surrounded by philosophy all the time. You know, Dr. John Thornhill does an amazing job teaching philosophy. I teach a class as well. It's not like we have a huge number of more classes in chiropractic philosophy than other schools, but it's just everywhere you look, there's chiropractic philosophy. So you don't have to search very far. Um, it's in the technique classes. It's in the assemblies. It's, you know, you can find it pretty easily here. Mm -hmm. So for some students, they don't engage with it because they're just kind of floating down the river with it. But it does take them towards a destination. Later, when they decide to swim, they already kind of got some background there to swim with. So what's important for students, and you highlighted it, resources. Go engage. Go to chiropractic offices and see as many practitioners as you can. If they, if they want you in that office, that's probably a good practitioner. If they don't want you to come visit, don't visit them. That's probably not the place for you. And the more you see chiropractic offices, the more you're going to have an idea of how you want to. My practice was based on all the different offices that I've seen throughout chiropractic school. And me and my friend used to go to as many offices as we can during break. And we put them in notebooks, all the things. Now I would just take digital photos. And when it comes time to build your own practice, you have it. Go to seminars. I Once you figure out who you are, you should probably start going to seminars that challenge you a little bit, different than you, not to indoctrinate you, but just to kind of make sure you don't want to be in an echo chamber. You know, mm -hmm. so figure you out first and then be open to having conversations that stretch you, push you, different perspectives, try to take on the role of others. And if you kind of do that in your ethical in your engagement with the profession you're probably going to graduate pretty darn good student great advice great advice um 
what are some outcomes of your quarter one philosophy students that that you intend that they come away with this from this class with? <laughs> um, I got a chance to revamp and teach philosophy kind of however I wanted. So, you know, the two outcomes I have, and they're not student learning outcomes, they're just kind of based upon what my goals are. My goals are number one is I teach day one intro to chiropractic philosophy. So I really hit the definitions of terms pretty hard within my class as defined in Stevenson's or some other places. Um, what I'm trying to prevent there is let's take innate intelligence or tone. Uh, how D.D. Palmer defined tone is not the same as a guitar tone or music tone or tone in, in uh, quantum physics he defined it as, you know, functioning in the nervous system and how it leads to overall health. So but you'll see students use tone differently. And the same thing with innate. Um, a friend of mine would always say, come on, innate, give me a good parking space up front. That's just not the role of innate intelligence. You know, innate intelligence, self heal self-governs your body. So we get these terms that aren't bad terms in chiropractic, but people are really sloppy with their definitions around those terms. And they use them so loosely that it creates confusion about innate intelligence. That's why there's so many different definitions for a lot of the terms. So I really want them to learn the, the terms as they're defined so then they can start having conversations. And they can disagree with the definition. They're going to learn the true definition. So then we're all on the same page to have a conversation. That's outcome number one. The second thing I do in my class is... You know, multiple choice, true, false questions aren't great for chiropractic philosophy. If I had my true way, I would bring students in and just give them an oral exam. Here's a normal complete cycle. Walk me through it and they can do it pretty good. If they kind of trip up, I'm going to test them on a little bit, but I can't do that either. So um, too many students. Um, so what I do with my classes, I list off all the different topics within chiropractic philosophy, like let's just say innate intelligence, universal intelligence, subluxation, adaptation. And I ask the students to create a two minute video on their assigned topic as they were explaining it to a layperson. And then they get feedback from me and feedback from their peers. And then they have to, again, create a one minute topic video. And the goal is if you can take a complex concept and explain it simply to a lay person, you own that concept. And it also gives them real life practice. Like you need to educate. I tell students you've, it's up to you to educate your patients on what chiropractic is. And there's not like one lecture that can win everybody over. You have to do a little bit at a time all the time. Mm -hmm. So you can do universal intelligence one week. You can do innate intelligence the next week. You can do this. And they need to be little nuggets that the person can absorb because it's about them, not about you. So mm -hmm. that's what I, it, and then hopefully later they can translate it. If they represent chiropractic, well, they should be able to make TikTok videos. I feel comfortable. So instead of having the most God awful worst case scenario, bombastic chiropractic on TikTok, I would love to see ethical, you know, chiropractic that I, the way it's intended, the way that I'm proud of what chiropractic is being out there on videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Love it. Now, you know, these types of conversations are just explorations as to like, what's important, what are chiropractic students learning? What's important if you want to become a chiropractor to focus on? Um, I shout out to Dr. John Thornhill, by the way, uh, your other philosophy <laughs> teacher, we did like an hour and 20 minute uh, talk on here on vitalism and the paper that he published and uh it's brilliant he went, he went really deep uh with me on that video so yeah um dr monique andrew said if you can't explain it simply you don't understand it yeah and, and scott kelly said you're one of his favorite people uh i love all those guys yeah so what's your vision for the future of chiropractic education what are some ways we can improve it what are some ways that um you see younger, maybe younger chiropractors contributing or people that are at, you know, 20 years in like you contributing um, that are really helping students find their way maybe a little more efficiently or giving a bigger picture um, so that students can thrive in chiropractic education today. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, 
I remember the first day I was chiropractic college president. I'm like, I felt like he man sitting on, on like a throne or something. I'm like, I could, I could tell this school to paint all the walls purple and they would have to do it because I'm president. And then the second day you're like, oh my God, there's so many stakeholders. Like you got accreditation, you got national boards, you got donors, you got students, you got incoming students. There's so many different stakeholders in chiropractic education that it's extremely hard to make a decision that satisfies everybody. Like you just got to start making decisions on what's best for the institution. So when I think about the future of chiropractic education, I mean, we have to get students licensed, you know, and that's probably the priority. Number one is like, if they can't get licensed, they can't practice. So, so much effort from a chiropractic institution is around getting students able to pass boards, et cetera. We also have to be accredited, you know, so there's an accreditation a kind of obligation you have there as well. And then to be honest, from the student perspective, you want to give them the background knowledge that they have. Like they should know what's, uh, I always say green light, red light, and yellow light. Like when's it okay to adjust? When's it okay to adjust with some kind of some caution and thought and when you shouldn't adjust, like you should be safe to the public. Um, they should become skilled chiropractors and on the analysis and, and, and facilitating the correction of vertebral subluxation. They should have philosophy. They should be um, a consumer of science. They need to understand neurology. There's so many stakeholders for the students. Students want information that's relevant. If they see the relevance, they'll jump through any hoop. Like, so I tell them today, you know, in chiropractic philosophy, I said, you may not think this is the most important class for your first quarter because you're going to be freaked out about other, like maybe biochem or whatever. But I think this is one of the most important courses for your career. And you try to bring in the practice relevance as much as you can, because I have found students, if they see the relevance, they'll do it. If they don't see the relevance, they'll memorize it, regurgitate it, dump it and can't remember it. So I think we must continually try to find ways to show students why this information is relevant, how it builds upon itself. And I think that would lead to students being happier with their education experience and also try to get them as practice ready as you can, you know, business courses and, and understand that as well. That's a lot to fit in within three years with that many stakeholders, but the more students can see the lay of the land and why it's important, I have found that students are usually pretty happy to, to go through the process. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate you saying that's a lot to fit in within the course of three years, because I totally agree, which is why I'm, I'm sort of proposing that we add another three years on the front end and say <laughs> that there's, there's actually a lot to develop within yourself. Um, and I kind of split innate into your inner state, your inner scientist, thinker, artist, teacher, entrepreneur. I'm curious if you like that acronym, how that sounds as far as orienting people of how they can kind of develop themselves into yeah. chiropractors and, and check in with themselves of like, am I completely neglecting the entrepreneur within me? Am I completely neglecting like how I'm my mindset and how I'm thinking about chiropractic? You know, what's what's my focus this semester? What's going to be my focus next quarter and putting together a more well structured uh, parallel plan for each unique person, because like right. you said, everybody's so individualistic. You know, Rick Sapio talks about simplicity on the far side of complexity. And I think as a chiro future chiropractor, you need to be aware of how complex these systems are. I just am in wonderment of how complex and integrated the human body is. So for example, the other day, yesterday in chiropractic philosophy class, I was talking about, you know, there's universal intelligence and what effects it has on the body, like gravity and outside forces. There's innate intelligence, what it's doing to deal with the situation. You have your educated intelligence because you basically are making decisions every day towards or away from your health. I was talking about eating donuts yesterday because I was must have been craving my maple bacon donut. That's, not my, that's an educated, that's probably not an innate decision, it's an educated. So you have universal intelligence, innate intelligence, educated intelligence, you have instincts, you have intuition, you have all that stuff going on at the same time. And it's important to kind of tease out what all those things do and not just be, you know, peanut butter and chicken noodle soup. So when I think about a plan for students is you're going to have a curriculum at school and there's something called in academia, the hidden curriculum. That's the, 
that's the people you surround yourself with, the seminars and everything else outside of school. And every student has one. And that hidden curriculum will feed you and support you either healthily or not healthily. That's why I'm a little like, I don't know if it's innate because I've seen some bad, bad hidden curriculum for students where they're getting told to do things that they shouldn't do, whereas innate would always be good. But it's important to basically take ownership of your path, dig into school, but surround yourself with a great tribe that supports you, find mentors. If you're deficient in a curriculum, you know, like I used to teach chiropractic adjusting and I know Dr. Shout out to Dr. Kelly because he helped me with that. Um, and students typically want to work on the things they do well for chiropractic adjusting instead of coming in saying, Dr. Russell, I'm really struggling with gone said seated chair. Can you help me? Very few students want to do that. And some of them that do, you're like, man, you're awesome because you know your weakness. You're identifying that you need development on it. You found a resource and you're growing because of it. And that's the path. I can't emphasize that enough is find your tribe, make your own kind of life curriculum, not life university, but life. Like what, what are you going to do outside of school? Make sure you're exercising properly. You're doing all those things that feed you. Find your tribe like Dan Lyons, Rob Sinnott, Brad Polk, still within my inner, inner circle in chiropractic. I'll call them at any time to talk through an issue. I love taking Dr. Lamarche still out for dinner or lunch, just just being around his awesomeness. So you just find those people that push you, find those people that support you. And then if you align all those things, you'll see a really big trajectory happening for students. They'll take off like rockets. And then just really briefly, would you agree or disagree that this hidden curriculum that you just rattled off 40 different things that students <laughs> need to do needs to be more of a, a focus of being less hidden to the incoming chiropractic student just because chiropractors, right? Like it's an approach to life. It's a practice. It's, there's so much that goes into being a chiropractor that um, you can't really learn in a textbook. You have to experience for yourself that uh, I just want to get your opinion on like, this hidden curriculum you talk about that every student has, I agree with you 100%, but we don't know what we don't know, right? And there's so much that you just touched on that might just roll over somebody's head, but is actually the curriculum to become a chiropractor. Not to downplay the significance of getting your license and going through the actual curriculum, but... <laughs> well, it's a partnership. I mean, it's Structure. it's really, it's, I don't even know, a partnership's not the right term. It It's these two things are happening at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you talk about Dr. Thornhill, you've talked about so many, I know so many brilliant faculty members that are doing those things, mentoring students inside the institution. When you talk about the hidden curriculum, and I'll just say this as a former president, these are things that happened outside your institution that you can't control, but you're always going to have seminars that come around campus. You're always going to have speakers. You're always going to have some of them that come in through assembly or some that are just around, you know, any chiropractic college is going to have tons of seminars around it. And you, you mentioned Dr. Monique. She's got a great online seminar. There's like some of them that are, I think are brilliant. And I think some are great for students to go learn more and they can go and explore. There's some of them that may not feed them. You know, I, that may not be a match for them or, you know, so you just want to make sure you vet it properly as a student. I think if you go and you're open and if you explore um, and if it doesn't fit you, you just don't go back. That's fine. I think sometimes you need to be exposed to different things, but sometimes they like students will start to stay within a club that they join because they don't want to break up with the club and it's not a fit for them, but they don't get out. And that creates a problem down the road. So you just want to find things that align to you mm -hmm. and make sure you vet all your experiences. You know, there's great chiropractors and there's some that, you know, I may not think is a great and you have to just figure that out for a little bit. So there's some exploring that by the student they have to do. So vet those people. Um, there's brilliant. I've learned so much from outside seminars and there's some that I, I think may not be totally worth the student's time, but I'm not here to tell you which ones those are. Those just go explore and align yourself and, and make sure you kind of 
go in informed, you know, and learn as much as you can from those people. And if it, you get something out of it, great. You know, if you really can't tell you how many like extremity seminars, weekend seminars on technique that I went to that I learned so much from, or, you know, I remember going to Russ Earhart seminar, which is an x-ray one for us old timers, you know, and there's some great things, but you're always going to have this outside curriculum. And so if you're surrounded by four students that think chiropractic sucks, sorry, I'm being a little blunt, you're going to start thinking chiropractic sucks. I want to be around four other students in my tribe. If I'm a chiropractic student where I'm the lowest level and everybody else is super achieving and that will raise you up. So you got to pick your tribe carefully. You got to pick your mentors carefully. You got to pick what you engage with carefully. And, and I think it, besides carefully, intentionally is what I'm really trying to say. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate the advice. And as we wrap up, I just want to let you know something I recognized the other day, which was that uh, pre-med and pre-med life have over 900,000 hashtag uh, information bits that have been uh, put out there on the internet and pre Cairo have about 215 mm. uh, information bits. And so whether we realize it or not, the, the profession of med the medical profession is investing heavily in pre-med right. all the time, cultivating a culture that supports these incoming students to know what their options are, to know yep. what the schools are offering, to know, to be able to differentiate um, from, from what aligns with their values and what doesn't align with their values. So right. I just, uh, in speaking with you, cause I know my time's limited with you and I, I would probably love to ask you a number of more specific questions just about how to transform or adjust the preparatory, you know, how to create a preparatory curriculum that can actually be acknowledged and accredited to get into um, high schools or community colleges or to, to undergrad institutions. But if those curriculum, sorry, if the curriculum is disseminated within student bodies at different colleges and high schools, and we're able to get chiropractors and health centers in those colleges and high schools, what does that do uh, for our brand of what chiropractic is in the edu you know, the educated populations of society? Right. Not, not talking about educated intelligence, just although that's probably pretty dominant in that population, but I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, yep. I think the profession can do a better job of reaching future chiropractors. Um, the things that popped into my head is, you know, just more concentrated efforts on not just waiting for, you know, there's recruitment of students, but educating the population about what chiropractic is. And then that as a career path, I did some early work probably in the late nineties where in Illinois, I would find a chiropractor in every town that had a, a university community college. And I asked that person to kind of be that spokesperson for chiropractic for those colleges to reach out to them, get engaged with it. So I think for as a field practitioner, um, you want to become that hub, uh, that information hub. So you can reach out to schools, do, you know, give career talks. You can go to the universities and say, if you have a pre a pre professional club, let me speak. And I think those things will grassroot that a little better. But I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. I agree with you. Because at Life University, you have Life Force Docs, which is a mm -hmm. docs, and every school's admissions department has these hubs of information that you're talking about. And I can't say that we're going to get as much out of that chiropractor if we expect them to contact the schools and set up yep. their arrangements. But if there's a, a structure in place so that students are contacting them and they're able to say, no, this student is not right for my office. Maybe you should talk to this other office and starting to have the pre Cairo club sprout up as right. like the first practice for that student before they go to chiropractic school, they start their own pre Cairo club, just kind of as a parallel to what it's like. Obviously, they need to have a strong foundation of what they're representing. Right. And like I said, there's far too much misinformation on what chiropractic is, and it isn't. But I'm just touching on a couple of things. I know that our time this is some hot topics. Over. But uh, yeah, anyway, I appreciate you. Thank you for all the contributions and getting on here and, and just talking with me this morning. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I, I do want to close up. I, I, you're absolutely right. Life Force does kind of help support those doctors doing that. They're just, I, I agree with you completely. There's just more work to be done 
to increase awareness of what chiropractic is for the population. So for the students, some, some outgoing advice. Um, I think chiropractic is sometimes when you're in it can be a little bit of a hot mess, but it is by far the most beautiful hot mess that I've ever been involved with. I, I'm so proud to be a chiropractor. Um, I'm honored to be a chiropractor. That stewardship, I love the lessons I learned from the predecessors in, in moving chiropractic forward uh, for humanity. It's no greater calling. So if you're thinking about becoming a chiropractor, look into it. I, I know that you'll be super happy with your career choice. So thank you for having me today. Absolutely. My pleasure.